All right, so. We can't see you. Oh, you can't see me? One second. Hold on. I don't know why it's not working. Hold on. Try again. One second. Okay, so I'll leave and come back and then we'll, we'll try it again. All right, so we just uh, watched this uh, song that they were singing at the end of the video. It's a song that we sing every week before we uh, hear a Hasidic discourse on Shabbos afternoon after Mincha. It's a custom that uh, we share a Hasidic discourse. And uh, this week, there's no different than any other week, we sang the same song and someone shared a Hasidic discourse, and uh, just thinking about who they were at that time and who we are at this time, brings to mind what the Rebbe told the Reperet Smachkin, all the Shom. Reperet Smachkin was one of the Hasidim who was in Russia during the hard times. When he was finally given a visa to leave Russia and come to America, he had an audience with the Rebbe. The Rebbe said to him, you have to teach everybody the Kal Vachomer. Kalva Chomer is one of the 13 principles uh, how the Torah is interpreted. There are 13 principles of Torah interpretation. And one of them is Kalva Chomer, which means that if I can do A, if I could touch the roof and you're taller than me, then certainly you could touch the roof. That's Kalva Chomer. So the Rebbe said, if in Russia they kept Yiddishkeit, so Kalva Chomer, how much more so should we, should we keep it? And the, and the same kind of dedication that they had, we have to have in, in our circumstances, where, where we don't have the challenges that they did. So the Rebbe told Rebbe Peretz, he should come to, when he comes to uh, Montreal, and he uh, shares, and he forbrings, he should teach everyone the Kal Vachim. That's the Rebbe told Rebbe Peretz. So they had a Febrengen, and Rebbe Peretz, of course, was still traumatized by his experience in Russia. So that during the Febrengen, when anyone will walk into the Febrengen, the parrots would say, Eretz Nunzere, you sure he's not an, an informer, is he one of us? Because that's how they would Febreng in Russia. Like, any minute someone could come in and they could be an informer for the KGB and they may have a beard and everything, but he could actually be an informer. So the parrots was going through having the Febrengen, but still totally traumatized. Anyways, at the conclusion, the Febrengen was a very lively and enjoyable Febrengen, and it went till 3, 3 a.m. And a parrot said, the Rebbe said, I should teach you the Kal Vachim. Let me tell you. He said, in Russia, when anybody uh, would fabreng till three o'clock in the morning, it didn't mean that they, the next day they just took off. The next day was a regular day. So if that's true in Russia, where we couldn't have proper eating and drinking and sleep, and yet when we had a fabreng until three o'clock in the morning, the next day was regular, how much more so here in America and in Canada, we're free for certainly... Everyone should be here tomorrow morning. He was talking to yeshiva students to do their Hasidic Hasidus. They should learn Hasidus and be here at 7.30 a.m. for Hasidus. So one of these students told me the story. He said, on a regular day, not everybody was there. But after a parrot said that, the Kal Vachemer, so every single student arrived the next morning at 7.30 for Hasidus. That's the idea of the Kal Vachemer. There is a famous story, a Mendel Futafas, used to always share about preziv. Preziv means to uh, stand before a uh, interrogation board, interrogation board, a, a um, interrogation board. Preziv means to stand to present yourself to be brought into the army. They would, they would examine you both your mentally and physically to see if you're able to uh, serve in the army. So many, many Hasidim would do all kinds of different um, tricks to be exempted from the army. Some people would break bones. 
and they would do all kinds of things to look sick and to be sick. So they wouldn't have to serve in the army because serving in the Red Army meant you couldn't keep kosher, you couldn't keep Shabbos. And uh, it was very, very hard. Your life was, um, besides the actual danger of serving in the army itself. So there was one, in time there, Brashab, before the yeshiva students would go to Preziv, they would always go on Simchas Torah the, the year before that they had to go to Preziv, and they would come to the Brashab, and they asked the Brashab for a blessing so they should get an exemption from the army. The Rebbe Rashab would generally give three different kinds of blessings to the Hasid. One of the one of the languages of his one of the nusachs, one of the ways that he would phrase his blessing was, uh, "God should their eyes should not see you at all." That was one nusach. That meant when you came to Brazil, you would get a a white card that you're free to go and you're 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 totally. Uh, unable to serve, and you're you're totally um, you're okay. Another nusach, another wording of his blessing was, uh, "God should help you." Something similar to that. God should help you, which meant it won't be so simple, it won't be so easy. You'll have to do some kind of trick or something to get exonerated and to get get acquitted from from service. But but you get out of there. Then there was a, sur- a third text of his blessing, which was. God should watch you wherever you are, which meant you are going. You are going to have to serve in the army. Sorry, that's where you're going. God should watch you wherever you are, wherever you'll go, but you're going to the army. So in that time in Russia, there were um, many uh, uh, different conditions that were placed uh, on weddings. When a groom and a bride would become engaged, they would draw up a start name, a conditions about the wedding, but they wouldn't uh, draw the same conditions that we have today. They would add a clause, and one of them was that the groom will get a white card that he'll be exempted from the arm. Without the white card, the wedding will not take place. So they're only agreeing to the wedding, provided that the groom is exempt from the army. Um, they didn't want there to be a situation of an aguna, of someone who uh, doesn't know where her husband is, or they didn't want a, a situation where they had to make a promise that they couldn't keep. So the wedding was always predicated on the groom getting an exemption from serving in the army. So one chasen, one groom, came to Reb Rashab on some chastera, and Reb Rashab said to him the first version, the preferred version, their eyes should not see you at all. And he knew that meant that he would be exi- he would be acquitted. He wouldn't have to serve in the army. So he went to his fiance's father, and he says, "We're right. We should start the preparations for the wedding because I just got exempted from the army." So the father-in-law said, "Well, that's very wonderful. Uh, how did that happen? I thought you're going to go to Brazil. I thought you're going to present yourself to the board of examinations in a few months." So the boy said, "Well, I didn't go to the board of examinations." But I went to Rebbe Hashab, and Rebbe Hashab said, their eyes won't see me at all, so I'm, I'm exempted. He said, no, 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 that's not called an exemption. That's called a blessing. An exemption is a white card that the, you get from the, from the, from the uh, examination board. So the boy says, listen, I already got my exemption. You're not keeping your part of the deal. I can marry someone else. If you're not going to keep the part of the deal, I am going to try to find a different bride. And that's, and, that's, and that's as far as that's concerned. So they went together to a rabbi to determine who was correct. So Mendel Futafaz didn't say the end of the story. He just said the beginning of the story, which was Mendel's way, so that we should know something. What was the, what was the next part of the story, which is the beginning of the story? <laughs> they came to a rabbi. They came to a rabbi. And the rabbi listened to the claim of the father of the girl, he doesn't have the white card. Okay. And he asked the boy, what's your claim? He says, I got a blessing to have Rashab. So the rabbi smiled. He smiled at the, at the naivete of this young man who thought that a blessing is just as good as a white card. So Mendel didn't say what actually happened, how he, how he, got, how he got exempted from the army or if the wedding took place. He did say that this rabbi was eventually ejected from his position in this Hasidic community. 
because even though his his smile, his looking at this boy's pure faith with with ridicule, even that that meant that he did not have the proper uh, respect for the blessing of a tzaddik, and this community didn't feel that he was fit to serve as their rabbi because he didn't he was missing in his amuna. The same Rebbe Peretz, he himself uh, once went to the Rebbe when his um, when his, uh, his, his, I think it was his wife was about to give birth. And I'm sorry, it wasn't his wife. He asked for a blessing for someone, I don't remember who it was, a relative of his, and it was by the Fabrengen. And the Rebbe gave a blessing. And in the middle of the same Hasidic Fabrengen, the Rebbe was leading, Rebbe is there, and he gets word that the person who's asking a blessing for, it's worse. It's worse. And he went back to the Rebbe, asked again for a blessing. So I heard this from Apinya Khorf, Apinya Shav Rafur Shana Kreva, Rebbe Rafal Pinchas Ben Sar Ben Chaya. Apinya said the Rebbe took Rapparitz's hat and drew his hat all the way to Rapparitz's Repar- nose like this. And the Rebbe said, It's not her fault that, she, that you don't have Amuna in me. It's not her fault that you're missing faith in me. In other words, having faith in the blessing is what draws the blessing down. So it's not her fault that you're lacking your moon in the blessing. And that itself, the faith in the blessing will give that, that that's what was needed to bring the blessing down. That's the uh, first story I want to share about faith in the tzaddik. And if they had faith, listen to these chassidim, how they had faith in the Rebbe and the way they talked to the Rebbe gives us some insight of what it means to have trust and faith in the tzaddik. But it's not only about faith in the tzaddik. Even when you have faith in the tzaddik, it's necessary to make a vessel to receive the blessing of a tzaddik so that the blessing can have something to rest in. On the same lines of the first story, uh, there was another chassid of the tzemach tzaddik who also had to go to Preziv, but it wasn't the time of... of uh, uh, it was time of the tzemach tzaddik and the czar's army. And uh, he, uh, his son, they were from Vitebsk, and there was a great hunger in Vitebsk because a lot of people were very miserly there as well. And many people were very hungry. And this man's son had to present himself in Preziv to the examination board to see if he could serve in the army. And he went to the um, his father, went to Tzemach Tzedek, to ask for a blessing. It used to be the rule in the, in the Tsar's army that an only child is exempt from serving. But, but they changed the rules recently. And this boy, his only child, was now had to go before the preziv, and, and he went to, to Tzemach Tzedek, to ask Tzemach Tzedek for a blessing that his son should be exempted from the army. Tzemach Tzedek, Tzemach Tzedek said, I cannot help you. So the guy is, is totally broken. His son has to go to the army. The rabbi says, I can't help you. Please, Rebbe, help my son. I want to be exempted, exempted from the army. So I'll set it repeats again, I cannot help you. This man, this chassid, he was friendly with the Reb Marash, some chassidic's son who later succeeded him. And he went to the Reb Marash. He said, I went to your father, asked for a blessing. He said, he can't help me. So Reb Marash said, let me speak to him. Went to his father. He says, you can't help him. He has only two days left. You can't do anything for him. Some chassidic said, what do you want from me? I cannot help. And then the Samach chassidic said, Go bring a medish tanchum, a safer, a book, a medish tanchuma. Tzemachsadik opens medish tanchuma to Parshas Meshpatim. In Parshas Meshpatim, Torah says the laws of, of uh, giving loans. And Torah says that when you are kind and generous and you help someone out who is poor and you give them life, so Hashem says, I swear to you, that when your child is unwell and your child's life is in danger, and you, just like you revive the life of a poor person, Hashem says, I will pay you back soul for soul. I will give you soul for soul. That's what Samach Tzedek said. And he closed the book. And that was it. A little while later, news came from Vitebsk that this Chassid son was indeed exempted from the army. So the Ebma Rash had to consult shortly afterwards 
with a certain Dr. Habenthal, who was in, uh, in Vitebsk. And the Reb Maharaj, when he traveled to Vitebsk, he wanted to hear more from the Chassid, what had happened because of this unusual thing that his father had done. He opened the Medrash. What did that mean? And he asked this Chassid if he had done anything special on the day that his son had, had presented himself to the examination board. And he said, I didn't. He said, go ask your wife. And his wife said, this guy came. He was hungry. And we, he asked us for food. And we said, we can't give him anything because we're so, we have to go to, we have to go to present ourselves on the examination board today. We have no, we have no space and no time to help anybody right now. So the uh, this guy was really hungry. He said, I haven't eaten in days. You have to help. And so she just remembered she had just put out a whole meal for her family and no one wanted to eat because they were so, they were so grief stricken about having to go to the examination board. So she quickly gets the food from inside the house, gives it to him. So the Emir Ash understood what his father had said, because you've given life to the poor person, Hashem says, I promise you, I swear to you, I will pay you back a soul for a soul. I'll give you back the life of your son and merit of giving life to the poor person. So while it's true that emuna, faith in a tzaddik, opens up the channel for blessing, there's always a need to have a vessel for the blessing. In this case, this guy's generosity, or accurately, his wife's generosity in giving life to this person is what brought the blessing down for them. And in a similar way, there is a Pasuk in, in Tilim, How fortunate is someone who thinks about a poor person on the day of trouble, God will save them. So the regular translation of the Pasuk is, you think about a poor person, and not just, not just you try to help them, but you think about how to help them in a way that doesn't embarrass them, and God will help you on your day of trouble. But other commentaries say the Pasuk has to be read a little, little different. How lucky and how fortunate are you if you think about a poor person when things are difficult for you? If you think about it, if you try, when you have no space in your heart and mind to help someone else because of your own troubles, and yet you think about the other person, so the Abisha says to you, there's a unique response in heaven. There's a unique response in Hashem. Ashri Master Odol, the comment is supposed to be after the words Bayim Ra. How fortunate are you if you think about a poor people, people in need, when you yourself are struggling? Because then God responds to you in a different way. Anyways, we shall invent us all with a good of and a freilich of Ach, Ere Vesimcha Asasim Vikar, the light and joy, gladness and honor, and safety and blessing. And the main thing is that tonight we should go to Shalim Ra Kadesh, Hara Kadesh. In the base of Migdash, Shashlishi, Mashulash, with Mashiach Tzakeinu and all those who passed away, and Chis Amesim, tonight, Mamish. L'chaim, good luck.